And we've been in the study of the Gospel of John, and we've come to this section leading up into these works, or weeks before Easter. We're really diving into the rest and trial and, and crucifixion of Jesus, and what an incredible practical thing to be studying right before Easter. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a very well-known section where we're, we're talking about Peter and his denial, his denial of Jesus. And uh, we're going to be looking specifically at John 18, verses 12 through 27. Now, we're going to read this in a minute, and then we're going to kind of refer back to it the whole time. And so if you have your Bibles open throughout the time, it's going to help you follow along a lot better, so I encourage you to do so. Um, and if you don't have a Bible and you're here with us, it's on page 904 of the Bible that's there in front of you. But let me begin by reading this passage we're going to look at this morning. John 18, starting in verse seven, or, uh, 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had been ad advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did the other disciple, another disciple, since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of his disciples, aren't, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together, and I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard me what I have said to them. They know what I have said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is this is how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? And Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it, saying, I am not. One of the servants of, of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I, did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. May God bless the reading of his word, and let me pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege again of the, your word, of the time of being able to come and study. Thank you for the things that you're teaching me. Father, just the, the joy of, of discovery of your word for the incredible truths that are here. Father, I pray now that you speak through me and in spite of me. Father, help us to hear what you have for us each today. Father, not only in understanding a story that happened uh, thousands of years ago, but, Father, to understand truths that apply to us in our lives. I pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, I want to tell you, this is, uh, there's a lot here. There's a lot of you know, wonderful things that you know, just are fun to unpack, to learn, and I've enjoyed. And it, it's such a familiar story. You know, but as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about Peter and embarrassment and failure, and, and it made me think, you know, what makes a mistake embarrassing? You know, one of the most obvious things is that when you get caught doing it, when other people see you, when you fail publicly, um, you know, it's one thing to do something dumb, it's another thing for people to see you do something dumb. You know, I don't know about you, but I do dumb stuff all the time. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure, and I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one that does dumb, dumb stuff, but... Fortunately, a good portion of the dumb stuff I do, no one's there to see it. And so I'll do something dumb, and I'll look around, did anybody see that? Okay, good. Okay, I, I got away with it. You know, and, and, and it's, you know, I might learn from it, I might laugh about it, but I don't need to be embarrassed because I wasn't exposed. Nobody saw me. At least I hope nobody saw me. But the embarrassing level goes up a level when you not only make a mistake and you're caught doing that, but when you make a mistake or fail in an area that you have bragged about or that you have presented yourself as somewhat of an expert. Now, I remember a time where this particular thing happened to me. I was uh, in, my, in my low 20s. Uh, my, family, my family, I was living with my family, and most of our family was down in West Palm Beach, Florida. And um, at that time, my youngest sister was about to turn 16. We had a cousin that was right at the same age, and they were both getting ready to learn to drive. 
And I remember I was driving somewhere, they were both in the car, and it was a, you know, a dark evening, it was pouring down rain, as it can in Florida, and I thought, this is a good chance to give them some driving lessons. So I started to explain to them about some of the unique challenges of driving in the rain and how they need to be careful and hydroplaning. And, and as I'm going through this driving lesson, I'm driving through the dark and I suddenly hit a big pool of water and I'm going too fast for the circumstances and I immediately lose control of the car. It sort of slide ways off the road and smack side into a tree. And, and, and as I know it is hurt except the car and my pride and... Um, but so much for the driving lesson. I tried to explain to them, you know, that this was really a, a, a visual illustration to show them in an, a way they will never forget about the danger of driving in the rain, and that didn't work very well. And uh, now you might be thinking, well, it's not that embarrassing. You know, it's just your, your, da- your, your, your youngest sister and a cousin. And Yeah, but for the next months, people would see me and they'd see the car and they'd see this big dent on the side and they'd be like, what happened to your car? And if they were around, they were glad to tell everybody. You know, oh, he did this while giving us a driving lesson about driving in the rain. That's when he hit the tree. And, and I'm like, oh, man. It's, it's... Now, I can laugh about that. It took me 30 years to laugh about it, but it's, you know, I can laugh about it now. And, and especially it's an area that you're confident. But what if we fail in an area that that's life-changing. That's not something we can laugh about. That's what I think we see here in, in the story of Peter. I mean, he was so confident, but yet in the area that he bragged, that's where he failed. Now, the context is this. We began to look at the beginning of John 18, for those who were with this last week. And there we saw that, that Jesus had been arrested. You had this huge group of two to 300 you know, uh, Jewish leaders, temple guards, Roman soldiers, that they came to arrest Jesus. Now, the religious leaders had wanted to arrest Jesus for quite a while, but they didn't want to do so publicly. He was out teaching in public every day, but they knew that since he had a following, if they arrested him in public, it could start a whole, um, you know, a riot. It could start a problem. So they were trying to do it in secret. So they had gone to Judas, and they had bribed Judas to say, okay, now lead us to a place where it's, you know, where it's night, where it's dark, where Jesus is alone, where we can capture him and nobody notices. Now, this is the perfect day. It's Passover evening, and, and everybody's in their home, and Jesus is in this garden praying by himself, and Judas leads them there, and they not only arrest him, but their goal is to get rid of Jesus. And so now they want to somehow get rid of him before anybody knows what's going on, so they decide to have a trial there in the, in the middle of the night. And so this trial starts, you know, like in the middle of the night. It goes all the way through, literally, daybreak. It ends when the rooster crows at sunrise, and the trial was totally illegal because Jewish law was very specific about the rules of trial. You couldn't have it under sundown or sat after sundown. You couldn't, definitely couldn't do it in the middle of the night, especially on the night of, of Passover. And there were so many things that were totally illegal and even about the lack of witnesses and all these things. And, and then you have this totally illegal trial, but what's happening is you have these religious leaders trying to get rid of Jesus and convict him in a trial but they've got to do it in secret because they know he's guilty of nothing. But to convict him, they now need to break all their own laws and and break the laws to somehow have an illegal trial to convict him of being a wrongdoer. And you see the irony of this. Now, in the midst of this, we see that, you know, John 18 seems to indicate that all the disciples, uh, most of them ran away when Jesus was arrested. And the, the two that didn't were Peter and John. And so when we read John just a moment ago, and it says the other disciple, that's John speaking of himself, the author speaking of himself. And so you have these two that that follow Jesus to the trial. Now, before we dig more deeply into this story in John 18, I need to step back and and look at something else about the context. And we're going to go back to John 13, because earlier in that very night, before his failure, Peter made some really, really broad declarations. He was so confident. And we're going to see that there was an arrogance he had and, and, and the danger of that spiritual arrogance, not only in Peter's life, but in our own lives as well. So let's look at John. I'm going to turn, uh, just, I'll put these verses up on the screen. In John 13, Jesus is eating this Passover meal with his disciples. And it's this last meal, and it's, he goes through, he's teaching them all these things, including he's giving them the, the, the Lord's Supper. And bringing new meaning into these elements of the bread and of the cup. And he's teaching them about what he's about to do. 
In John 13, 33, he said this, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now as I'm saying to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Now, when he told them where I'm going, you can't come, the context lets us know he's not talking about heaven. He's specifically talking about his death on the cross. And what he's teaching them is, is teaching them and us, is you can't pay for the price of your own sins. You can't fix that yourself. You know, so I'm going to now do for you what you can't do for yourself. You can't go where I'm going. And it's all about the cross. And hearing this and the great love and the, and the offer of grace, Peter struggles in the way that many of us often do. And that is we hear this and, and it's hard to accept a gift of grace. Why? Because part of us says, no, I don't need that. I, I can do it on my own. I can, I, I, can, I can accomplish it. And look at what he says in verse 36. Peter said to him, uh, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but after you have followed. So he's still asking about this. There's this whole interaction. And what you're going to see is that in this interaction, he's, he's struggling accepting Jesus' love because he, part of him feels like he doesn't need to earn it. He can perform. And, and we have this natural instinct, that, and it's a religious instinct, that, that what is religion? Religion is performing. It's about saying, okay, God, here are the, I can keep the rules. I can be good enough for you. I can, I can earn my own way. I don't need you to die for me. Now, again, remember, Jesus is telling them about what he's to do for them. He's telling them, I'm going to do this, and you can't do it for yourself. And why? Because we're, we're helpless. We're, we're needy. And, and we, we need his love. But again, Peter's struggling with that. And it's something that's deep down in all of our nature, because you know what, in all of our relationships, all of our human relationships, there's an element where it's performance-based. I do these things, I earn my spot, and, and there's something in us that feels that's the way things should be, not only in human relationships, but even in our relationship with God. And so what you see is Peter responding to that, and he says, you know, well, you know, what do you mean I can't follow you? I want to follow you. And look what his objection is in verse 37. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. I want you to see what is going on here. Jesus said, I am going where you can't go. I'm going to lay down my life for you to pay the price for your sins. And you can't do that. He's confronting religion. You know, you can't accomplish your own salvation. So I'm going to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And Peter's objection is basically, Jesus, yes, I can. I can do it myself. I have what it takes to take care of myself. In fact, I don't need you to lay down your life for me. I'm going to lay down my life for you. That's what he's saying here. I don't need you to perform for me. I'm going to perform and save you. And I love Jesus' response here because there's irony here that, that, that I want you to see. He says, Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? You know what I think he's saying? He's saying this, Peter, are you going to lay down your life for me? You think that's what it's about? You think you have what it takes to perform for me, to save me? Peter, you don't get it. You think you have what it takes, but truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Peter, you don't have what it takes. You're not going to deny me. You're, you're, gonna deny, you're not going to die for me. You're going to deny that you even know me. And what is he saying here? Why is he telling him this? I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to expose Peter's failure. He's trying to expose, it's not about what you do, Peter. There's something in your heart that I see that you don't see. You don't have all that it takes, and I know that. But he isn't rejecting Jesus or Peter. So I don't think Jesus is looking at Peter and saying, when he says this, oh, Peter, I wish you loved me that much, but you don't. I'm disappointed in you. I think he's looking at Peter and saying, Peter, I see, I see brokenness in you you don't see in yourself. You think you've got it covered, but you don't. You think that you can perform for me, but you can't. But I love you, not based on what you do for me, but based on grace and what I do for you. I love you and your failure. I love you knowing how broken you are in the inside and knowing that that's going to express itself by your failure in your actions as well. Now, the problem is, is that if we're not aware of this, there's, in, there's great danger because we're unaware of our sinfulness and our vulnerability. See, Peter was unaware that there was something in him that would fail. 
And when Jesus is looking at him and says, you're going to fail me tonight, Jesus doesn't reject him because of this. He's saying, Peter, I see in you your sinfulness. You know why I sin? All of us, you know why we sin? I, I, my problem isn't my sinful behavior, it's my sinfulness. My sinful behavior is just an expression of my sinfulness. And what happens is that I can control it to some degree, and then I get the temptation, and the real me comes out. And it's exposing the fact that, that I'm broken. We're all broken. And Peter said, no, I'm not. And Jesus said, yes, you are. And up to this point, what he's doing is he's proud of his obedience. He's, he's not getting his identity from Jesus' unmerited love, but he's getting his identity for his performance and his great love for Jesus. In a sense, Peter's responding to Jesus as a teacher, but not as a savior, because Peter is Peter's own savior. Peter's, he's, he's not overwhelmed by his need and by Jesus' grace. He's overwhelmed by, by Jesus, you don't know what I'm going to do for you. He had a false identity, and that identity was in his goodness. And Jesus is pointing out his failure, not to beat him up, but to help him become aware of his needs so that he would find his identity not in himself, but in Jesus' grace and in Jesus' love. When he tells Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me this night, he's not condemning Peter. He's teaching him something so that when he does fail, he would understand, Peter, I loved you even when I knew you were failed, even beforehand, and now that you have failed, I love you just as much. And he's saying that my love for you is never based on what you have done for me. It's always based on what I've done for you. See, the amazing thing is that when Jesus talks about this failure and it's when we see it happens, it is a crisis, but it is also an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to grow, for us to learn. What was Peter's core problem? It was arrogance. It was spiritual pride. It was self-reliance. As Jesus is telling the disciples what he would do for them, you know, Peter said, no, let me tell you what I'm going to do for you, Jesus. And what happens is that he has self-confidence and that self-confidence always leads to self-reliance. And he didn't see his own weakness. He didn't see his own need. That caused him to see self-reliant. And so when he's saying, I'm going to do this, we see the self-reliance. The first part of it is we see in, chapter, in the first part of 18, which we looked at last week. You know, you have this big group. 300 people come to arrest Jesus. This, you know, this big group of soldiers. And you got Jesus and a couple, you know, 12 disciples. And it's an overwhelming group. And we looked at last week that they come up and they said, you know, Jesus said, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus responded, I am. Not I am he. That's in our, our English Bibles. They've added the he to make it read better, but it's not what it says. It's I am. Now, we talked about that a lot last week. If you weren't here last week, you could go back and listen to the message online and you understand why this is so significant. He's giving himself the name of God. And he says, I am. And when he does this, look what happens. Look what happens just speaking this word of the name of God. When Jesus said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. These 300 armed soldiers fell off their, back, off their feet, knocked on their butts simply by his spoken word. Now, what's happening? Jesus is trying to give a message to them, to us, that even though there seems to be this overwhelming force, that Jesus was always in total control. By his word, he could wipe them out. And then he asks them again, and he says, okay, well, now I'll surrender to you. I'm not going to use that power. I'm going, to, I'm going to use my power in surrender. Now, Peter didn't understand this, and it's clear because when Jesus then surrenders, he looks at it and said, well, Jesus, let me, you know, take care of you. And again, I, you know, you have this image of, you know, he pulls out the kazoo and, burp, 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 you know, and just let me take out my sword. And he comes out swinging, and, and it's almost humorous where you have 300 people, and Peter says, I'm going to take them all out. And what does he do? He doesn't attack a soldier. He doesn't attack a leader. He attacks one of the unarmed servants. And if he's trying to hit him in the head, he misses, and he gets the ear. If he's just trying to warn him, he misses, and he takes off the ear. Either way, he's a really incompetent guy. If the whole rescue plan is based on Peter, we're in big trouble. And so what do you see? You see his failure. He's incompetent. He's unable to do that. And, 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 you know, Peter thinks he's going to deliver Jesus, you know, he can't. And why would he think that after Jesus just showed he was in total control? Jesus, by his word, was in control. But Peter thinks, I can do it. And he couldn't. You know what? That's what happens in self-reliance. When we're self-reliant, we think, I can do it. And it seems to work for a period of time. It seems, especially if we don't have any big trials or temptations, we can do it in our own strength for a period of time. And, and we might even get more confident, more self-reliant, but then something happens. 
Like with Peter, you suddenly have 300 people. When Peter, you're surrounded by all these people. What will happen is sooner or later, we will all be overwhelmed by something bigger than us, something bigger than our strength, bigger than our ability. And so when 300 people come to arrest Jesus, Peter takes out his sword. But again, I think, I think these soldiers were almost laughing at him because he was incompetent. And, and you look at that, and he couldn't do it. He couldn't protect Jesus like he boasted. And next thing you know, then he's surrounded by much of that same group in the courtyard, and he sees watching Jesus at that trial, and he's seeing Jesus being beaten, and he suddenly is fearful, and he not only can't protect Jesus, but he suddenly doesn't even have the strength to identify with Jesus. And, and he responds by denying him. In fact, let me show you the wording, because it's, it's amazing some of the stuff that John has here. Of, and he makes something really, really clear by the wording. It's really beautiful. You know, we saw, again, already that twice that Jesus had gone to the people when he was arrested and said, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And twice he responded, I am. You know, he said, I am, using that, that name of God. Now, keep in mind that response, I am, and keep that in mind when we look at Peter's response. The first two times Peter's asked, are you a follower of Jesus? Jesus said, I'm looking for Christ. I am. They come and they say, are you a follower of Jesus? And look at his response. Verse 17, servant girl comes and asks him. He said, I am not. Verse 25, are you one of his disciples? And he denied it and said, I am not. Same terminology. It just, you know, it just changed. I am to I am not. And John is really intentional here using certain words. You know what I think is going on? Why did he fail? Because standing in the courtyard, surrounding by the enemies of Jesus, seeing bound and being beaten, he sees only the threat of the world, and he's lost sight of the great I am. Did he need to worry? No. If he remembered the great I am, he remembered that Jesus was standing in front of this same group of people, and by a word, he could knock them off their, be- off, off their feet, that he was in total tra- charge. And yet, what happened? Peter didn't see that. I don't think he really got it at the, at the uh, garden, because he was thinking, what am I going to do? What? And he totally missed what Jesus did. And he's focused on himself, and because he's focused on himself, that that he didn't see Jesus. But the problem is when we look at ourselves, we're going to sooner or later all be overwhelmed by something bigger than us. And when we are, the fact is what's going to happen then? The fact is we're going to face stuff bigger than we are. And at that time, we're either going to stand in the great I am. We're either going to stand in his power and his strength, or we're going to stand in our own strength and we're going to realize I'm the I'm not. And it's going to fail. And so what is the challenge? The challenge is at all times to say, God, I need to remember my weakness. I need to be overwhelmed by you because the overwhelming things will come. And as we often say, we will either be overwhelmed by God or we will be overwhelmed by circumstances. We will not be overwhelmed by both at the same time. We cannot be. But the important thing is in the good times to be overwhelmed by God so that when the circumstances come, we are still in the great I am. We need to recognize our weakness If we think we're strong and capable, we're going to go out in our own strength. And and again, it may work for a little while, but it's going to fail. But, you know, here's the wonderful thing is that we will all go out on our own, and we're all going to fail. But when we fail, God doesn't condemn us for it. God uses our failure to grow us and to drive us to depend on him. Because when we face a temptation that's bigger than us or trial that's bigger than us, you know, at first, like Peter, it's going to surprise us, and we're going to try, and then we're going to fail. It's going to expose our weakness and And it's especially bad when it's the area that we thought we were strong. See, but God doesn't reject us. God didn't reject Peter when he knew that he would do it. I love in in Luke 22, it tells us that he denied Jesus, and Jesus looked across the courtyard and looked at Peter in the eye. And I don't think that Peter's sitting there, Jesus saying, I'm mad at you, or I don't think it's like, Peter, I'm so disappointed. I think he's looking at Peter and saying, Peter, I told you so. I told you you are going to do this. You thought you had it. I told you you didn't. Now I'm inviting you to the grace that you didn't think you needed beforehand. He's trying to get us to be more aware of our weakness because the fact is Christian, the Christian life is all about learning to be more and more aware of our weaknesses. More and aware, more, why? Because the more aware we are of weaknesses, the more that we will seek to live in a state of dependency upon God and his strength. 
The weaker we are, the more we find his strength. That's an idea that Jesus is not only teaching here, it's taught throughout the Bible. Jesus had tried to teach it even earlier in that very night. John 15, Jesus is talking about the idea that he's the vine, the, the grapevine, and we are like branches. And look what he says, 15, 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself and let it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. What do we need to realize that we're nothing by ourselves? Like a branch that's cut off, we don't have access to life, to strength, to power. That we may seem to blossom for a little while, but we're dying. So what does he say? I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is who bears much fruit. But for apart from me, you can do nothing. It's only when we are aware of our weakness and plugged into him that we thrive. But apart from him, we're dying. We can do nothing. The more aware of our weakness we are, the more we're going to live in a state of dependency upon God. And that's a beautiful truth, but there's something more here. There's something, let me show you something else that I think is, I think is really, I've never seen before. And that is, that is John is really intentional in the story, linking the behavior of Peter to the behavior of Judas and showing us that they failed in similar ways. They had similar failures even though they had incredibly contrasting different outcomes in their life. And let me show you how this, he plays this out and he's really clear in it. It actually begins back in chapter 13. In chapter 13, Jesus in verse 21 to 30 said, one of you are going to betray me and, and, um, and they don't know who that is. And, and shortly after that, that's when Peter says, you know, you know, no, I'm going to die for you, Jesus. And I think what Peter is saying is, Jesus, I know that you said one of you is going to betray me, but I want you to know it's not me. I want you to know that I am going to be the reliable one. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to not only not fail you, I'm going to perform for you. I would die for you, Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and says, no, this very night you're going to be, be, you deny me. And basically, one of you is going to betray me, one of you is going to deny me, both of you are going to fail me in similar ways. Now, that's the hint of it. Now, let's look what happens in chapter 18. You see that, that they, they say that both of them failed Jesus in very similar ways. Look at the, if you look at the first part of 18, when you look at this, it tells us that Judas was there, but it doesn't tell us anything about what Judas was doing. I want you to look at the words that are used to describe Judas' role here, right? Verse 3, so Judas, having procured a brand of, band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now, here's the image. He, Judas is there. He's with this group of people that are opposed to Jesus, that are seeking to destroy Jesus, and they're surrounded by fire. They've got torches. They've got weapons. They've got, you know, lanterns. That's the image, right? Then so Jesus comes, and he says, who are you looking for? And Jesus of Nazareth, verse 5. Jesus said to them, I am he. Look at the wording here. Jesus, or Judas, who betrayed them, was standing with them. Doesn't tell us anything he's doing. He's just, Judas was standing with them. Now keep those words in mind, and now let's look at what happens. Judas is standing with the people that are seeking to destroy Jesus. Now let's look at Peter. Jesus has been arrested. They go to the high priest's home. And look at how John describes the setting. John 18, 18. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they're standing and warming themselves. What's the setting? They're standing in the midst of the dark of night, surrounded by all the same people, and they're, surrounded, they're standing by a fire. One, they've got, the, they've got the weapons and the torches. Here, they still got the weapons, and now they're just by a charcoal fire. Same image. And look at how it describes Peter. Peter was also with them, standing and warming themselves. How did it describe Judas? Judas was with them. How does it describe Peter? Peter was with them. Same words. They were in the same camp. Now, you might say, well, no, no, geez, Peter was just there physically, but he wasn't really identifying with Jesus and his accusers, and no, he was a follower of Jesus. All right. Think about this. The whole issue of the denial is what? Would you be identified with Jesus? And what does he say? Are you one of his followers? And he repeatedly says, no, I am not willing to identify with Jesus. I'm going to identify with you guys. I'm here with you. I'm standing with you. Just as Judas did. Oh, he made bold claims in the, in, in the, the dinner. He made bold claims earlier on and saying, oh, I'll die for you. But now when he's asked, he's surrounded by the enemies of Jesus. And he's asked, will you 
be a follower of Jesus. Will you respond to Jesus? And he repeatedly, three times, says, I'm not with Jesus. And what does it imply? I'm not with Jesus. I'm with you guys. Just like, just like Judas. His failure is very, very similar. Now, the question is, how do we see this, though? Judas, I mean, he's evil, and we, he committed suicide, and, and his life was a failure, and, and Peter became one of the leaders of the early church, and if they failed in similar ways, how in the world did that happen? And here's what you have to realize, my friends. The difference was not their performance. It was not their sin. They failed in similar ways. The difference was what they did after their sin. See, Judas failed, and he only saw his failure. It was a story of Judas's failure, while Peter failed, and he then learned to see Jesus' grace. Remember in John 13, Jesus had told Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And what is he saying? Peter, I not only know that you're going to fail, but I know why. I see the sinfulness, brokenness in your heart. I know that's going to happen. And this offer of grace that I've offered to you, it's, I'm offering it in spite of the fact that I know you're going to fail. And Peter, I think, was able to think back of that and remember. See, when he failed, was Jesus disappointed him? Was Jesus surprised? Was Jesus, was Jesus like, man, I expected so much better? No, Jesus is saying, that's what I expected. That's what I knew. Peter is surprised because he thought more of himself than was there. But Jesus is sitting there saying, no, I know, Peter, your weakness. And what happened is that Judas only saw his failure. See, even when you think of the Lord's Supper, Judas was there, and it was a sign of, here's my body, here's my bread. Judas never got that. The grace was offered to Judas as much as it was to Peter. Peter Judas never got that. He failed, and he sat there and said, in my failure, I'm going to run away from God. In my failure, I'm going to kill myself. Because Judas was all about Judas' story. When you think of Judas, all you think about is his story, his failure. When you think about Peter, he failed in the same way. But when you think about Peter, it's not Peter's story anymore. It's God's story. When you think about Peter, it's not what Peter did. It's what Jesus did. It's a story that's redeemed. He learned to see Jesus. My friends, th these are truths are so incredible. It's, what is he teaching us? That we need to learn to embrace the redemptive power of grace even in the midst of our failure. The difference between Peter and Judas is not, not their performance. They both failed in similar ways. It's that one learned to see the grace of Jesus and the other didn't. And we're all going to fail in many ways. Many of us have. And many of us have things in our past that man, we're ashamed of and we, wish, we hope that nobody knows because people know we would be even more ashamed. And, but here's what I want you to challenge this is teaching that we need to believe that God's grace is greater than your sin. Do you understand? You know, there, I talk to people all the time that say, oh, I did this, and I'm so ashamed, and God, God ever forgive me. And, and, and there are things, I don't want to downplay the significance of that. And I know that there are people that are almost certainly here that you live with guilt that has haunted you for years, for decades. I understand that. And I want you to understand that God's grace is greater than your greatest sin. That this is presenting Peter in the same light of Judas. And if you say, are you worse than Judas? Oh, I'm not worse than Judas. Well, Peter was the same path as Judas, and God somehow not only forgave him, but used him and made him a great leader of the church. And if God's grace was great enough to forgive you or him, why do you think that God's grace isn't great enough to forgive you? And if you say, well, I have a low view of myself. No, no, if you believe that, that's not a low view of yourself. That's a very arrogant high view of yourself. Because what you're saying is, no, you don't understand. My sin is so great that God isn't greater than. My sin's greater than God. I'm greater than God. I can mess up more than God can forgive. My friends, you don't understand the grace of God. And I understand that in that failure, it's often a failure that we're so ashamed of, like Peter was, but he understood that God's grace was greater than his sin. And that's, that he gives us the story because he wants us to learn this. And what do we do? We have to confess, God, I agree with you, I've messed up. I not only agree with you what I've done, but I agree with you there's sinfulness in me that I didn't see, and God, I want you to, to see that, and I know that you've always seen it, and God, I just now agree with you, and I need you to forgive me, and I need you to cleanse me, and I need you to change me. But it's not only a grace that we have from God. There's another part of this story that is really beautiful. This is a grace that we need to learn to show each other. He's calling us to embrace grace by radically living out as people of, of God's grace. Let me show you something that, again, that's hidden here that it's easy to miss. 
John 18, okay, it says in 15 that, you know, that Peter was, was, was able to get into the trial because he knew the high priest. 16, Peter stood outside of the door. And, all the, and so the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. Now, now there's all this detail, and you say, why is there all this detail? Because it's teaching us something. I want to tell you, in my mind, I always had this picture that, you know, Peter kind of snuck into the trial. That was, he's there in the back, and he's trying to hide. And nobody noticed him, and he's there by himself. That's not what happened. See, Jude, John and Peter went together. Peter was, or John was known to people, and he was able to get in because people who knew who he was. It's very clear here. And then he goes back, and he pulls some strings, and he says, well, you know, this guy Peter, he's with me. And so Peter comes in with John, and he comes in in a way that he gets a special pass, so he's noticed coming in. People notice him. And so he goes in the inner court, and, and what happens? We were reading 17, so the servant girl at the door said to Peter, are you not also not one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I'm not. Now, I want you to notice something. Look what he says. Are you not also not one of this man's disciples? Also, meaning another one. And what does it mean? She knew that John was one of the disciples. John got in because people knew him. He identified as one of the disciples. And now John comes in and pulls some strings and says, hey, this guy Peter's with me. And he's saying, oh, if you're with him, are you also one of the disciples like John? In fact, not only that, but you see the same thing in verse 25. Are you also not one of the disciples? He's associated with John. I want you to see, John was there. John didn't deny Jesus. John clearly identified with Jesus. People are looking at that and saying, are you not also like John who has identified with the disciples? Are you one of them as well? How do you think that John felt about it when Peter denied Jesus? John, who never denied Jesus, who actually got him in the trial on his name, who followed Jesus all the way to the cross, and yet he saw Peter deny him. How did John feel about that? You know what would be tempting? Flyweight, lightweight, you know, you know, all this braggart and all this. We don't know exactly what happened, but we do know John 20. Mary Magdalene comes running from back from the tomb, and John and Peter are there together, and they're the first two who together run to the tomb. And what does it say? Somehow in there that John learned to show Peter grace. I wish I had more time to develop this, but you go back to right before Jesus talked about Peter, you're going to deny me. Right before that, he said, love one another as I have loved you. And I think Peter, John remembered that, and he said, Peter's failed, but you know what? I failed Jesus many times, and it's now my job to love John, or Peter in the same way that God has loved me. How many times have I let God down? How patient is God with me? And I need to show that same grace now towards Peter. We're all going to let each other down. If, Peter, if, John, if John had beat pe pe Peter up, if he had always reminded him, I, mean, I don't think that John ever becomes the leader of the early church. It's only because they were a place of grace that John says, Peter, I know that you failed, but you know what? Let's remember the words of Jesus, and I love you, and, 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 and you didn't fail, you know, but I failed Jesus in other ways, and, and they were a place of grace. And you know what? God's called us to be that. We are all going to fail. We're going to fail at times like Judas and like Peter. We're going to fail in embarrassing ways. And are we going to beat each other up? Are we going to remind each other of your failures? Or are we going to say, okay, no, these aren't your failures. These are a story of God's grace. We're going to say, God's going to use you. God's going to forgive you. We should be a place of grace because we're loving each other as Christ has loved us. Lastly, in closing, it's not only we need to be that, but if we embrace grace, we need to let God redeem your story. You know what I love about Peter? is that God not only forgave Peter... He not only said, I'll take you back, I'll forgive you, but he then rose him up and made him the leader of the early church. This guy that failed, here you have Judas and Peter side by side, they failed in similar ways, and, and you know, Judas commits suicide, and he says, but I can use Peter to lead the church. Why? Because it was never about Peter, it was always about God. And he was able to say, let me tell this story, and the story isn't a Peter story, it's a God story. And he's able to talk about, let me tell you a failure, and that's where I learned about grace. And he actually, God redeemed the story so that it becomes a story that we celebrate now 2,000 years later as a story that teaches us about God. My friends, I want you to realize what that means. There may be some of us that say, man, I failed in this way. God could never use me. I don't you know about this. And hey, listen, if God could use Peter, if God could use someone who failed like Judas in that same category and say, I'm going to use that person to be a, God, a, a leader of the church, what is it that God, it's beyond God's ability to redeem in your life? 
And when I say redeem, it's not only that God can forgive you and look beyond it, it literally is redeem, buy back, use. And you know what's amazing is we hear people share testimonies that are up here. That we, At Easter, I hope and pray that we're going to have some testimonies that are here. And we're going to have people say, well, here's things in my life. Here's things that were broken. And we sit there and we say, those are the things that are bad. And they're things that we wanted to hide in the past. And, and now we share it and we say, and this is what God has done. And suddenly we're applauding and we're saying, not that's a terrible story, but that's a great story. Why? Because before it was a story of my failure, now it's a story of God's glory. Before it was a failure of my shame, now it's a story of God's grace. And God takes the things that I wanted to hide before, and now he uses it. And I see people in our church doing that even now. People taking their brokenness, taking their failure, taking their pain, taking things that, you know, you know, you know, um, in our recovery groups and taking things that are you know, um, loss and taking failures and taking things and saying, okay, I'm going to run toward this and not hide my story, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let God redeem it and say that God could use even people like Peter and people like me, people that have failed, because it's not about me, it's about God. It's God's grace is not only, there's no, not only no sin that is too great for God to forgive, there's no failure that's too great for God to use. Will you let God redeem your story? But it means bringing it to the cross. It means relating to him, not based on what we do, but based on what he has done for us. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to finish with that celebration, with communion, and, and that image of this is how we relate, not based on what we've done, but based on our acceptance, our acknowledgement of our need, and our acceptance of what Christ has done for us. Let me pray. Father, I thank you so much for the privilege that we have to come together, and Father, to be able to dive into this great truth. Thank you for the honesty of the story. Father, for the honesty and, and, and openness of, of John and of Peter and, and seeing their failure and, Father, seeing a true story not only of their weakness but of your grace. And, Father, I thank you that you would allow us to be able to see not only that in Peter but to learn those lessons that we apply to ourselves. And I thank you that, that even at that night that you wouldn't tell, tell the disciples, I'm going somewhere you can't go. I'm going to the cross to pay for your sins, that, Father, that even now we celebrate that story, that we come to relationship with you not based on what we've done, but based on our acknowledgement of, God, I can't do it, and our acceptance of what Jesus has done for us is symbolized even by, by this bread and by this cup. Father, I pray that you would help us to embrace these truths, to live in these truths, to be defined by these truths. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.